Good morning, church. My name is Neil Charlton. I am the youth worker at Streatham Baptist Church, and I'll be leading us in our online service this morning. Soon we'll be led in a time of sung worship by our worship leader, Claire. And then soon after that, we will be hearing God's word from Chris Boak. But before we go into our time of praise and sung worship, let us pray. Father, we truly want to give you thanks and praise for how you have led us through this week. You brought us once again to a Sunday where we can come and reflect and praise you for how you've been guiding us, providing for us and caring for us throughout the week. Sometimes, Lord, we've been aware of your presence. Other times we have not. And Lord, we come this morning not just to thank you and praise you for what you've done, but we want to give you praise and thanks for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you are our great shepherd. And we give you praise and thanks for that. In Jesus' name. Over to Claire. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our SBC service online. My name is Claire, and I will be your worship leader this week. Today, I just want us to take a time to worship and acknowledge the good father, the good shepherd that our father is. We've just come through the Easter period and I want us today just to celebrate, just to praise, just to acknowledge how good our father is. So if you are ready, gather around your TV, your laptop, your computer, and let's get into a time of worship. Let's be down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. No, you're never. You're never gonna let. 
our hearts, fill our lives, fill our spaces. Lord, we invite you. We invite you in right now, Lord. Lord, we want to build something so strong only on you. Only on you as you are the firm foundation, the solid rock. Yes, Lord.
But let's now turn to a time of prayer. And let's think about our world and all the many things that are happening. Let us take this time to come to the Lord and lift up any concerns that you're aware of within our world that we can take to the Lord in prayer right now. Let us also pray for the church, for the global church, but also for the local church. At this point, we may want to lift up some of the names that are in our church bulletin who are currently sick or unwell or recovering from illness. And lastly, let us pray for our families, for our neighbours and for ourselves. And so, Lord, we want to lift up all of these areas to you. We want to lift up our world and all the concerns within it. We want to lift up the global church and our local church. We want to lift up our families, our neighbours and any concerns that we also have. Lord, we ask that your will be done and that your kingdom come in all of those areas. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So let's turn now to our church notices. Many of you hopefully will have received your bulletin via email so you can get further detail there. But I just want to highlight a few things from the bulletin. On Sunday the 25th of April at 6.30pm we will be gathering online on Zoom for our joint listening assembly to continue the discussion on racial justice. Now, after some time in prayer and reflection, we want to continue this vital conversation together. So please look out for further information uh, via email about that next week. There will be no SBC Connect prayer this coming Thursday on the 22nd of April. 
as we will be gathering online for our monthly church members meeting. And so the details of that meeting will be sent to you via email before the 22nd. So that's our church membership meeting on the 22nd of April. Starting from Sunday, the 2nd of May at 6 p.m., we will be starting a new initiative called the Good Book Club. And it's going to be a six week series of Bible studies on Zoom. And we will be studying the book of Psalm 23 using the Right Now Media materials online. And you can sign up to Right Now Media from the SBC website from now so that you can get ready for the 2nd of May. And there's a trailer, a video that you can watch um, describing the Bible study. And so once again, from the 2nd of May at 6.30 will be the Good Book Club. And if you'd like further information, please just contact the church office. First Peter chapter five. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing fir firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Shepherds. Farming and shepherds. There's a lot of interest in farming at the moment, it seems. And that's partly because it's lambing season. And some of you will have seen Adam Henson with his new television farming programme. And I saw recently him in the lambing shed. In fact, I even thought of calling this sermon Moving Moments in the Lambing Shed. Seeing the ewes there undercover and in the straw and then the, 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 the little lambs are appearing amazingly and strutting about on their little legs and Adam Henson paying them attention and speaking about how moving it was, even after many, many years of being a shepherd and involved in lambing, how moving he found it on every occasion. Now, our chapter this week, 1 Peter chapter 5, is about the work of shepherds in the church. Uh, usually today we speak about pastors or leaders rather than shepherds. Uh, Peter here says elders several times and he says oversight in some of the versions 
use the idea of oversight in this passage. And he refers to the church as the flock of God. Uh, other translations include the idea of shepherd or shepherding. Now what we'll do is we'll follow the verses through carefully and we'll tease out Peter's meaning and try to apply it in our series on Jesus as the Good Shepherd. This is the next. So the first thing I notice about the shepherd uh, is the context in which the shepherd works and lives. This is verses 1 and 4. It starts with the sufferings of Christ and ends with the glory that is to be revealed. Uh, any shepherd's work and life is linked back to the long context of Jesus' life and suffering and coming in glory. Uh, why would you bother otherwise if there's not a, a wider context, a longer story in which you are involved uh, in your caring, in your shepherding? If there's no long purpose to the universe, I may as well live for myself and do what I want to do rather than to live for some other purpose. I might live for short-term pleasure, but in fact, you see, there is a long-term story. A saviour who suffered, and Peter points that out, he's dealing with suffering in the letter generally, and he points out that he observed the suffering of Christ. And uh, then he not noticed that uh, again, finally, there will be a crown of glory that will never fade away. There is uh, a purpose, finally, to all we seek to do for God, for Christ. So when you make a decision to care, when you make a decision to serve others, to be, if you like, a shepherd or a pastor to others, however that role uh, is, is given to you, it may be painful, it may be hard, it may be difficult to make that choice, but that is Christ-like because it is sharing in his suffering. And uh, it comes again, uh, the, 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 the glory to come uh, is the, the longer context. You have a motive to act and strength to act as a shepherd for others. Not that you do it for the glory, but that gives it point, gives it purpose. All that you're doing as a shepherd, as a, one who cares for others, has the suffering to begin, but also the glory that will not fade away, that is to come. So there's the first thing. It's about the context in which we work as shepherds. The second thing about the shepherd, which comes over clearly, is the idea of responsibility. This is in verses 1 and 2 and 4. Now, there's a popular idea today that we are all shepherds. And I've been to churches where they don't have anybody in charge, really, it seems. And they just simply say, oh, well, we all care for one another. Now, this is fine. And so we should care for one another. Each one of us has a duty and nearly all of us have some kind of caring role, even if that's unseen or at home or in a different context than the church. Or if it's very modest, it is still a duty, a caring role for others. So we do care for others. But here Peter is addressing some, not all, he says there in verse 1, uh, about the elders among you. I'm speaking, he says, to the elders among you. So in the context of the church, there are those who are set apart, who are the shepherds, who are the leaders, the pastors, and he talks about them as elders. It's worth noting, too, that this is plural, as elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, there are individual leaders, pastors, elders, but generally speaking, they are spoken of as a body, those who share together in the responsibility of the church, of the pastoral care and leadership and teaching of the church. So there is a special responsibility for some to tend or to shepherd, as he says in verse 1 and 2, and to have authority in verse 5. Better than authority or equal with authority is the idea of responsibility, and that's what I want to stress here. 
Now, there are levels and areas of responsibility, and you might think of yours. You may have a leadership role of some kind, officially on a leadership of the church, or be one of the pastors of the church, and to you especially, this passage is addressed. But there are others, youth, children's work, uh, women's work, men's work, uh, the practical stuff which happens in all churches and communities, or beyond that, outside, Think of your particular responsibility in family, in community, uh, among neighbours, and so on. There is levels and areas of responsibility. But here, primarily, it is about uh, leaders and pastors. And the French have a very useful word for this. They call the leaders of the church les responsables. In other words, they are the responsible people. Um, so you have to ask yourself, for example, uh, if there's a significant death in the church, who should go? Some uh, notable member has grown old and has gone to glory, has died and gone to glory, and the message comes to the church. Who should go? Well, one of les responsables, one of the ones responsible, who have been put in place by the Lord and by the church to be responsible for certain duties particularly those kind of sensitive pastoral duties. There's also all kinds of other things that happen which to do with teaching and organisation and finance and so on, which we put people in responsible positions to serve the Lord and serve the church in that way. It's a bit about age, and maybe there's something about that. Elder means older in these places in the New Testament where that word is used. But it isn't only about age, uh, it's about wisdom, it's about character, it's about the ability to handle the kind of duties that you might be called upon to do, and also to represent the congregation. So that's the character side of it. You said an example, and he says that later on. Uh, those who are appointed and made responsible are representatives of the congregation, both within and beyond the church. So we've got uh, the context uh, of Christ's suffering and life and coming glory and the responsibility of uh, those who are the elders in the church. Uh, the third thing I've got here is about balance. And here we come to the heart of Peter's teaching. Uh, there is a balance of attitudes, motives and methods of those who lead the church. And they are put to us by Peter in uh, three pairs. The first one is not out of compulsion, but willingly. That is very interesting, that, because you see, it is possible for people to take leadership positions for the wrong reasons. Uh, sometimes they are very negative reading reasons. Uh, people are forced, as it were, into the position because there's nobody else or because and they feel obliged to serve or they feel guilty that there's nobody doing this and so they they go out in some kind of uh, from some inner compulsion but also of course the opposite people can manipulate uh, other people into uh, leadership roles into responsible roles for which they are not keen whereas peter says here no the opposite needs to be the case you need to be willing and of course we should all be willing but willing to do the thing which is suitable for us and which is needed and to do so uh, with willing enthusiasm. There's an old saying, isn't there, from Dickens, from David Copperfield, uh, which has become popular. Barkis is willing. He was willing to marry one of the women in the story. And he sends the message, Barkis is willing. Barkis is willing over and over again. And that should be us. We should put our own name in there. John is willing. Sarah is willing, Andrea is willing, Andrew is willing. Put your own name in there. I'm willing, I'm willing to do what God is calling me to do and what others need me to do. Uh, but not under compulsion, either an inner compulsion that uh, I want to be this leader or the compulsion of others. And we have a great image in English politics of the person who becomes the Speaker of the House of Commons. When the Speaker is appointed, 
the tradition is that he's, he's an MP, he's a member of parliament, and he sits in his seat, and then the members go and take him and drag him up and seat him in the chair as the head speaker of the House of Commons. It's not to show that he's unwilling, but to show that he's not doing it for the wrong meters, that they really do want him to fulfill this role. And that's how it should be with us, not under compulsion, but willingly. I, whoever you are, am willing. And then the second pair he has is the sordid gain. Uh, sordid, not for sordid gain, but eagerly, he says. Uh, and here we get a, a very uh, classic phrase from the authorised version. If you have your authorised version or your King James in front of you, you'll read it says, not for filthy lucre, uh, which is, uh, implies for financial gain. But of course, it's broader than financial gain. It's about um, getting something for yourself. Sometimes, of course, it's money, uh, that there's a, a better salary or a, a job for you here. Uh, but more likely it's about kudos or self-interest that I want to become a leader, I want to become an elder because it kind of builds me up. I recall uh, a young student sadly uh, went to visit him in his church. There was something about him I wasn't completely easy about. He seemed to be rather brash and rather forward. And then he, I, I went into his office, the new, new church, he's just become the pastor. And this was the largest room in the church and it had the largest desk I've ever seen in my life. And I did wonder then whether this was appropriate for somebody who was supposed to be serving the church as a pastor. Sadly, he didn't survive. And uh, it was not to do with the desk, but to the attitude that led to the large desk. Now, don't you have a big desk in your life uh, it's good to be not for gain, but eagerly. In other words, with genuine enthusiasm, eagerness to serve. You used to use the word keen, keen Christian. I'm keen to serve. I'm eager to serve. The third pair that he uh, points is not domineering, but as examples to the flock. And here is a very, very tender thing in leadership. Leaders have to lead. Leaders have to make difficult decisions. Leaders sometimes have to tell people what to do. But Peter's very clear. It is not domineering. And of course there are terrible stories about uh, church leaders behaving in most inappropriate ways, forcing things and uh, arguing in a way which is inappropriate for a Christian leader. Peter says, now look, the exam be examples and of course there are many many wonderful examples and I'm sure that you can think think of the pastors in your own life or leaders of the church that you have loved and appreciated most what sort of people are they they are generally speaking humble gentle and pleading Christ-like they may be very competent they may be good speakers and all that but underneath there's a humble gentle example, Christ-like example. So uh, there's the third thing about uh, some sort of balance between those qualities. And the fourth and the last thing I've got here is about the response that the shepherd engenders or, or needs in order to do his or her work. Uh, there's no leadership, no pastoring or shepherd work without a responsive people. And this is what Peter goes on to say in verses five and six. And what he stresses is that the response of the people to their leaders has to be laced with humility. Let there be a humble attitude. Uh, clothe yourselves, he says, with humility. I uh, recall uh, when I was visiting colleges in the north of England, I went to visit uh, the women's college at Ripon and the Christians there uh, had been looking for churches and they'd settled on a little church, a little evangelical church in the town. And after it had been a couple of weeks, they enjoyed the teaching, they enjoyed the fellowship, they enjoyed the prayer and everything. After a couple of weeks of that, uh, one of the elders or a couple of the elders came to them and said, uh, you, you two young ladies, if you're gonna to come to this church, you're gonna to have to cover your heads. Now they went away after that instruction gonna have to wear hats 
these teen, these uh, young, vibrant, young, fashionable women, and they've been asked to wear hats. This was in the 1970s. And they were really quite angry and upset. They spoke to their fellows about it. In the end, having decided it wasn't necessary, really according to scripture, that was their view, they said, but we want to go to that church. There was only one solution. They had to humble themselves, be unfashionable, put on hats and go on a Sunday morning to worship with their brothers and sisters. When I heard that story, I was deeply moved. I'm still moved by it because here were people who, although they disagreed, although they found it difficult, they were willing to humble themselves under those leaders. They may say the leaders are quite wrong and I'm quite sure the church fairly swiftly moved on from that position. But the attitude of humility strikes me still as very, very powerful. Clothe yourselves with humility to those who are over you in the Lord. And we need to do that to put something on each day, which is called humility. And as we go out and as we meet people, we clothe ourselves, says Peter, with humility. And especially in the church, in our meetings, in our discussions, in our fellowship times, we clothe ourselves with humility in words and acts of service. And what does he say then? Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. The gracious God, someone said, is ever seeking depth that he might fill it. So you go down, you humble yourself. Even if it's hard to do, there you will find the power and grace of God meeting you at that point. Well, there's much more in this chapter. I encourage you to go away and read it and uh, meditate on the lovely things that are here. Uh, but I thought I'd end with this verse to end. And you can use a children's thing, really. But I find it very helpful to use my hands sometimes in prayer and in this kind of way. And it's the verse which uh, says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not have care about anything. For he cares for you. And it's that, simply. He cares for you. In this context, whoever you are, whether you're a leader, an elder, or a member of the church, or not anyone at all, to, to know that he cares for you. And the actions are, he cares for you. Got that? Do it with me. He cares for you. Now, if you're a leader in the church, you might say, he cares for them. Remember, leader, that he cares for them, the ones you're responsible for. So you can do it that way. He cares for them. All of them, from the greatest to the least. And of course, the most important bit of all, really, or equally important, is he cares for me, to remember that he cares for me. And as I humble myself, he will demonstrate that care in all kinds of ways. Should we do that then? He cares for me. May the Lord help us to know it and to work it out in our lives and in our service. God bless you all. Thank you, Chris, for sharing God's word with us this morning. Let us pause now and just take a moment to think. What might the Lord be saying to you from those words? What has the Lord highlighted for you? What has the Lord reminded you? you about. Let's just take a few moments to reflect on that.
Father God, we want to thank you for the word that was shared with us this morning. Lord, may your Holy Spirit bring us further revelation of your word. Not just for today, but throughout this week, may you continually remind us that you are our great shepherd. And Father God, for the times when we may forget that or become complacent of that, may your spirit stir us up and remind us. And Lord, for whatever else the spirit has spoken to us today, may you reinforce it during this week in different ways, maybe through other people, maybe through your own word. Lord, cause us to focus on you this week. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. As we sing our last song together, we'll be talking about and reflecting on that our Lord is our shepherd, our good, good shepherd. And he leads us to still waters and green pastures and he restores our souls. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. Let us say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. May you have a blessed and wonderful week and may you be reminded that God is your great shepherd.